Hey, folks, this is the True American Podcast. Got a returning guest, good friend of the show, and a very thoughtful individual. I mean, this, this brother, he puts a lot of thought to his positions. So I recently heard how, you know, some anti-trans legislation going on in Frankfurt. And I said, well, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something. So let me go to my brother here. He always, he always, he's always able to answer whatever question he can about the Commonwealth of Kentucky and Commonwealth of Kentucky politics and legislature and even history. So brother, glad you can join us. Thank you, Corbin. Always glad to be with you. And man, am, am, am I missing something? I mean, what's what is this anti-trans stuff? That's what I'm hearing, man. Well, <clears throat> You know, it's a it's a political environment that people run off of headlines and and uh, you know clickbait, I guess I'll call it, where it's easy to say something extreme and get people to react emotionally to something. This bill is actually much more simple than that. I mean, if we want to boil it down to its essence, the goal is to stop boys from going in the girls' locker room. Uh, not so much, you know, about trans anything. It's the fact that if you're a adolescent female you've got to be in that locker room getting undressed taking a shower and uh, you really don't need a 17 year old essentially grown man naked standing there next to you or in the shower with you i mean that's just not a safe situation so to me this is all about the safety in the girls locker room it's one of the things you'll notice is it's never the girls trying to get in the boys locker room it's always the other way around yes and, uh, you know and we've you know, going all the way back to junior high, guys were always trying to figure out how to get a peek in the girls' locker room. Well, right. you know, now we've created a situation where somebody who's, you know, 17, 18 years old, essentially a grown man, can walk in and say, I identify as a female today. I need to use the female's locker room. I need to get dressed with them. I need to take my clothes off in there. I need to look around. I need to be in the shower. And that's just not right. It's not safe, for especially for young girls. And we need to, you know, protect them, protect their innocence. They don't need to be feeling that. Uh, potential uh, sexual threat. You know, we've seen some horrible situations in other states develop uh, where, you know, there were sexual assaults in the, in the restroom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, bad, bad things can happen. And uh, so the bill basically says, it's House Bill 30, introduced by Representative Bill Wesley, who's a friend of mine in Eastern Kentucky. It says, you need to use the bathroom, locker room, changing facility that corresponds to the sex the gender on your birth certificate so um but but the and then if if that can't be accommodated then we are looking for single sex uh, restroom stalls uh you know just or single stalls excuse me you know just go in there by yourself and uh i realize we've got changing norms in our society and we've got some people that are having you know gender dysphoria and they're at awkward awkward times in their development is not intended to you know isolate anybody or shame anybody it's intended to protect young girls from males seeking to gain access as to what should be a safe place for them in the, in the girls' locker room, the girls' mm. the girls restroom. Brother, did you ever think 10, 15 years, you know, going back 10, 15, 20 years, that we'd be having this kind of discussion? No, I really didn't. Uh, yeah, we're, we're in, a, in a strange place. And, and I think there are, you know, some well-intentioned people that – see someone who's uh you know who's a child an adolescent you know struggling with some of these identity issues and they say well we've got to make a nicer environment for them we've got to make it safer for them we got to make sure they feel more accepted and and you know we should we shouldn't be cruel to adolescents who are having gender dysphoria or other emotional type uh, problems but at the same mm -hmm. time we can't have unintended consequences of the law which would jeopardize someone's safety and that's the situation we've got you know we're I mean, you you know, you can literally walk in there as an 18 year old senior and say, "I feel like a woman today, like mm -hmm. a girl today." I'm going to start using the girls' restroom in the girls' locker room, mm -hmm. and you know, a fully intact male is in there in a position that uh, uh, these girls girls are in a vulnerable state of undress, and they really don't want a, a grown man you know, taking his clothes off next to him. It's just, it's an intimidating mm -hmm. environment, it's an unsafe environment, and. Uh, you know, sexual assaults can and do happen in those those cases, and we've got to protect the safety of our of our girls in school. I think we as adults have to have to 
create a safe environment for our children. And that's what this is all about. Now, now, brother, is there anything that's come up about sports? You know, these men or these boys who think they're women or think they're yes. girls and involving in themselves in all girls sports? Yes, last, last year, we had Senate Bill 83 called the Save Women's Sports Act, and that was passed and is now Kentucky law. Uh, in fact, the House voted 70 to 23 in favor of that. Um, and that would prevent um, that you have to have to compete in the category that you were that you were born in with your gender. Mm -hmm. And again, I would point out um, what always happens is it's always males wanting to say that they are female and compete in female sports so that they yes. can win win titles, set records, get scholarships. Uh, so I think there was a an individual that's a swimmer uh, that was ranked number yes. four hundred sixty two as a male. And when he became determined he was female and started competing with them, he saw all of a sudden the national champion. Yes. And, uh, and that is an extraordinarily unfair to the female athletes that have worked their whole lives to get a college scholarship, make it to the NCAA finals, and then have a you know, muscular, testosterone-fueled biological male beating all their records. Yes. And, uh, and it really guts the 50-year-old Title IX um, act of the federal government to equalize funding for for male and female athletics. And that was uh, so that girls could get in on the uh, action in, in college and, and share in scholarship monies and things like that. And, you know, thousands of, uh, of, of females have gone to college on athletic scholarships in the last 50 years because of Title IX. Well, what does it do now? You know, how can girls get a scholarship if boys wearing a skirt or taking all the scholarships? Just just gutted it out. Just gutted out just that. It out. Wow. That's, that's... And, and like I say, if it, if it were truly a problem about people with gender dysphoria why do you not see any females saying i want to go compete against the men it's mm -hmm. always in the other direction i'm sure i'm right. sure there's one or two exceptions out there but um they, they want to compete in the women's ranks because they can win they can set records they can get scholarships they can win championships and it's just not it's not fair to the women and i i've even seen situations like with this mma fighting where a, a guy he claimed he was a woman he said he's a woman, and he competed against a female MMA fighter. Practically right. killed her in the ring. Yeah, yeah, skull fracture, you know, very serious uh, injury. And 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 yet, I was always raised: you don't hit a woman. That's right. <laughs> you know, you just yeah. you just don't. You know, she hits you, just take your licks <laughs> or run. Right. But you don't hit a woman. And yet here, in a sporting event. We saw this man just beat up on a woman. Right. Right. And it's just not, you know, uh, well documented that testosterone during your developmental years gives you an enormous advantage in terms of body weight, muscularity, uh, skeletal strength, uh, you know, speed and endurance and all these things. And it's, uh, it's a huge advantage in almost every sport. And, uh, you know, in theory, if someone had hormonal treatments early enough in life, they might reach some kind of physiological equivalence with females but for the vast majority of them, like the swimmer we're talking about he didn't convert until his senior year in college he'd been competing his whole life as a male yes. and then decided well i'm going to switch over and take all the women's swimming records and win the national title yes and uh, it's just not fair to the women that have worked their entire careers and are you know fierce athletes fierce competitors but it's very it's it, it'd be like as an ordinary male competing against somebody who's shooting up steroids all day long mm -hmm. You know, you just you just can't compete with the, with the hormones and the and the bone density and the muscularity that that, uh, that biological male has, brother. You know, I, it's I hear I see a lot of this type of you know pro I guess you might say pro trans legislation whatever coming from the Democratic Party. Has that been your experience? And if so, what's going on here? <clears throat> I think that there is an attempt by those on the far left to find a way to destabilize Western society, to break down our norms, uh, to, to do away with religion, to do away with the nuclear family, uh, to do away with our, our sexual norms and, and mores. Um, and that's been part of a leftist agenda going all the way back to the French Revolution. Mm. Uh, it's nothing brand new, but it keeps, it com keeps coming back in, in waves. Uh, they don't believe in God. They don't believe that God created the earth they don't believe that god created the male and female they don't believe that a male and a female should marry that they don't believe that um 
you should not kill someone made in God's image. I think your rights come from the government. And <clears throat> this is one of multiple waves of attack that I believe the hard left has to destabilize Western society. Mm. And uh, you may have heard of something called critical theory, uh, yes. which is, is the parent of critical race theory. But critical theory was something that was uh, brought out in an academic environment some decades ago. It was basically a critique of everything about Western society. It was a critique of, of the patriarchy. It was a critique of um, capitalism. It was a critique of democracy. It was a critique of, uh, of race relations. And yeah, basically all the things that were distinctive in Western civilization, critical theories sought to tear down. Mm-hmm. So um, gender roles, family roles, nuclear family, males and females getting married and reproducing. Those are all things that are a target of the adherence of critical theory. And it's something that's designed to destabilize Western society so that you can have a leftist socialist utopia mm-hmm. without God and without any moral standards. Well, I was just about to say the way you were talking, it, it just seems like straight up Marxist theory. But is it, it is. like a variation of Marxist theory? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an intellectual variation of Marxist theory. Uh, you know, the Marxists since the 1850s have been you know, changing their tactics periodically. You know, first they said, you know, workers of the world unite. You know, we need to throw over, overthrow capitalism. And that didn't work. And then in the 60s, they came back and they tried to use race agitation, you know, to overthrow Western society. And that didn't, that didn't work. You know, we still came back together. Now I think they're trying to use uh, gender and sexuality and uh, yeah. throw out the families. Just any, anything to drive a wedge into the, the, into the heart, the core of America. Mm-hmm. This America yeah, I mean, is generally made up for people who are, uh, you know, males and females uh, date, get married and have children and, and uh, you know, work and raise their family. That's what most of the people in America do. And that does not fit the agenda of the Marxists. They want to do away with the family, do away with the church, do away with private enterprise. Well, yeah. For, I mean, Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, they actually wrote a pamphlet on that. They talked about right. property, family. and all. I mean, they're, they're very clear and explicit about it. Yeah, the heart of the heart of Marxism is the elimination of private property. In uh, Marxist countries, communist countries are always atheist. They cannot right. tolerate the idea that is the first lines of our Declaration of Independence that all, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, including mm-hmm. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They can't tolerate the idea that those rights come from God and not the government. In a Marxist society, uh, all rights come from the government and can be taken away by the government. Mm. You know, your property comes from the government. The government can take it away. Your liberty, your ability to stay out of jail comes from the government. They can take it away. Your life, your ability to stay alive and not be killed comes from the mm. government. And they can take that away at any time as they demonstrate. You know, Marxist governments in the last century killed something like 70 or 80 million of their own citizens. Right, right. And, you know, brother, you you there seems to also be a danger of many times people – like if there's an economic situation, a bad economic situation, it, it seems like, hey, you know, we got to go to the government. The government's got to solve this. Or, hey, there was some past injustices. The government's got to solve this. Do you generally agree with that? Or maybe is that a little bit of exaggeration on my part? Uh, I agree that absolutely that that's happening and that people have that attitude. And that is part of that Marxist agenda because the government needs to be all powerful. They want for the government to usurp the, tr- the position that are traditionally held by the family and the, and the church in our Western society for the last four or 500 years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you've heard expressions like it takes a village to raise a child. Well, right. you might need some help from your neighbors, but it's really the mom and dad's responsibility to raise that child. Well, they, yes. if, if you remember from the uh, governor's race in Virginia, uh, that Yunkin won mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, uh, the issue there was wh- whose kid is it? And his young kid said, well, it's, you know, your kid, you're the mother and father. You need to make decisions about their upbringing and their education. And his mm-hmm. opponent said, no, this, the uh, children, you know, belong to the state. We'll decide how they get educated. Wow. And, uh, you know, you, you need to just stay out and uh, the, the state will raise your child. And that's, you know, the, the three-legged stool that they've got to eliminate. They've got to eliminate, uh, you know, religion and they've got to eliminate the family. And they've got to, eliminate capitalism mm. Man. you know uh, i just uh, not too long ago i, I interviewed uh, david horowitz and about his book dark agenda the okay. war to destroy christian america 
And I think he would largely agree with my, about everything you said. And uh, what really got me was that, you know, he's he's a brother, a Jewish brother, and he says, <laughs> I do not want a Christian America to be undermined or destroyed or anything like that. Right. Um, and it, it, and it's just amazing how people can, and I've heard it like on YouTube and TikTok, a lot of college students say, oh, we, you know, black people in America are oppressed. And I, and I oftentimes say to myself, well, what America are you talking about? Yeah. You know. Somebody forgot to tell the black president and the black Supreme <laughs> right. Court member and the black billionaire. and <laughs> <laughs> right. He's oppressed. Yeah. 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 But, you know, you, it's interesting you bring that up. I mean, it's like even Obama said once, what did he say? Something about he said uh, racism is is like DNA or something in, in, in the the USA is just part and parcel of the USA. And yet he was a two time president of the United States of America. Right. Right. You know, and, and there is a bit of a split in our history. You know, there were two parts of America that were settled in the early 1600s. One of them was settled in 1607 in Jamestown. And uh, they began to import their first slaves to work on the farm in 1619. In 1620, some guys landed up in Plymouth Bay in Massachusetts that were the Puritans who did not have slaves and believed in, you know, hard work and prosperity. And the bulk of the, you know, the Christianization, I guess, of America uh, and the moral values and the anti-slavery values all came from that Puritan establishment mm -hmm. up there in Plymouth Colony pushed down. And the Virginia Colony grew and gave rise to what was eventually the slaveholding South. The mm -hmm. Confederacy. And that's what we fought a civil war about. Right. It was a few years ago. <laughs> it was a hundred, 150 years ago. You know, we settled that issue and we yes. uh, established that uh, the three amendments to our Constitution that you know freed the slaves and and uh, gave voting rights and uh, equal treatment under the law to all people in the country. Right. And uh, and then we tuned that up a little bit in the 1960s, which was on oh, two generations ago with the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. And uh, so I think we're fighting a battle there that we resolved when you and I were kids. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah. you know, you brought up the Civil War. I I have a couple of uh, liberal friends, and and I was just, you know, we weren't arguing or anything, but I said, man, do you, do you realize what happened to this country? You know, i.e. the Civil War, how many people died? And, you know, they flat out said to me, no, I didn't really realize that. That's it amazing. I mean, it was horrific. I mean, horrific. tens of thousands of deaths. Hundreds of thousands, uh, 650,000 battle deaths, and, and a lot more than that if you include disease and civilians. And that's yes. when America was much smaller. Uh, I don't recall exactly what the population of America was, but it was probably uh, a fifth of what it is now. So right. it might be the equivalent of you know 5 million people dying right now mm -hmm. if we had a war. Split families apart, communities Split families apart. apart. Yep. So and, I, uh, I couldn't, I, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe there is, but I can't think of too many countries who said, you know, went the war over that issue of slavery. Right. I mean, okay, we're going to, we can't resolve it peacefully. We can't negotiate some. We'll go to war. Went mm -hmm. to war over that issue. That's right. Abraham Lincoln, before he got elected president, 1858. He said that uh, this nation cannot endure half slave and half free. We will either become all of one thing or all the other, but we, we can't endure as a union half slave and half free. And uh, that was a couple of years before he got elected. And, you know, it was true. Yes. But that process of becoming all one thing or all the other to become all free meant that all the slaveholders had to release billions of dollars worth of what they called their human property. Mm -hmm. uh, without compensation. So, yeah. you know, people that would have been extraordinarily wealthy in that day became paupers because uh, their slaves were freed, their plantations were burned, and that was, uh, that was they paid a big price for their sin. And, uh, yes. you know, a lot of people were complicit in that. And I think America played a blood sacrifice for their uh, sin of allowing slavery. But it was right. it was never desired from the beginning. It existed at the time of the founding in 1776, but there were, uh, slaveholders and abolitionists that were among the founding fathers and their intent was always to get rid of it because they knew it was inconsistent with the Declaration of Independence. Yes. They just couldn't get the job done 
Right. Uh, you know, it took 87 years to get the job done. Yeah. Well, brother, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up here, but let me let me ask a couple of quick questions. Going back to this whole, uh, you know, trans trans situation, um, and I just want to just make this clear: you're saying this legislation has nothing to do with. Oh, I hate you! I Absolutely hate not. you. This is us saying to young girls: we as adults are going to protect you. We're going to make sure that you have an environment where you are reasonably safe from. Uh, ogling and sexual assault in your own locker room. If you're in a state of undress and you're vulnerable, you should not have to have, um, you know, a naked grown man next to you. Right. No. Right. That's what it's all about. And if if people are experiencing some kind of gender dysphoria or confusing, uh, can't decide whether they're male or female, um, we can let those people use a single stall restroom. Uh, right. Or what they need to do and, and until they figure out which way they want to go. Common it, sense, simple things, but it it amazes it amazes me. On the other side, they just want to force push this one thing. No, we can't have a compromise here. It, it's got to be this way or or nothing. Yeah, and it, it, some of that is. I think there are some very well meaning people that are opposed to this legislation, but the people who start the problems are using this as a wedge issue. They want to they create animosity between people. You know, I'm I'm not interested in animosity. I would like for all the people in Kentucky to get along well, raise raise our families, uh, you know, engage in business and have a prosperous outcome for all of us. There you go. There's no 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 profit in division, but uh, there are those who do see profit in division. Right. By, by, by driving people to to hate each other. Right. Brother as always, it's been good talking to you. Great talking to you, Corbin. Yeah, appreciate you, brother. And uh, let's Thanks. do it again soon sometime, okay? Sounds great. All right, Thanks, brother. brother. We'll see you.